Good. All right, turn with me to Revelation chapter 6 this evening. Revelation chapter 6. Again, appreciate you coming this evening as we continue to study the book of Revelation, making a good pace, in my opinion. We come now to chapter 6. I think we can cover this chapter tonight during our time together. So let's read Revelation chapter 6, beginning at verse 1 and through the end of the chapter. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, will you judge until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever and ever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the holy scriptures, which are able to make us wise unto salvation. As we come now to study them, be our teacher. May we have a right fear of final judgment, and yet may we rest confidently and securely in a sovereign God who saves your people from that judgment. By faith in you, we are delivered From the wrath to come. Lord, assure us of your control as we look at this text. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we have covered five chapters of this book so far, and we're going to look tonight at the sixth. And in the previous material, two themes have stood out in Revelation. One is the idea that the kingdom of God has begun. John is a partaker and a fellow servant in the kingdom of God and of the sufferings that attend to the people of God. He is on Patmos because of that testimony. But he celebrates it, that Jesus has died and risen from the dead and made us a kingdom of priests who will serve his God forever and ever. In the very last chapter that we looked at, chapter 5, the Lamb is praised for redeeming his people and making them into a kingdom who will rule on the earth. John wants to make the point that that kingdom, long anticipated in the Old Testament, has already begun. There's a final coming, yes, Jesus will come with the clouds on the last day and he'll make new heavens and new earth. That will be the final consummation. But right now, the kingdom has begun. Don't think because the king is absent that there is no kingdom in effect. We are members of that kingdom, John says, Jesus has already begun to reign. So there's a second theme that has emerged, and that is the necessity of perseverance throughout suffering. 
Although the kingdom has begun, yet we are still suffering at times because of our testimony to Jesus. John is a partner in both the kingdom and the tribulation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those great themes, again, of the Old Testament, that that looking ahead, they saw God would come one day and he would deal out salvation for his people, judgment on unbelievers, tribulation for idolaters, salvation for those who believe. Many times these concepts are are pushed forward to to a final tribulation coming in the future seven years to be followed then by a thousand-year kingdom. But, But John wants us to understand those realities are now. God has reached forward, so to speak, and he has brought those realities into the present. The kingdom has broken forth into time. The tribulation is ongoing. We must therefore persevere through our suffering because we are members of God's kingdom. And just as chapter 4 emphasized that God was sitting on the throne, and just as chapter 5 gave us that great vision of Christ coming to the throne and and taking the, the, the scrolls, taking charge of God's plan for the end times, the times in which we live, so now as we come into chapter 6, we see Christ beginning to execute that plan. Now the sovereign Christ who is there with God on his throne begins to unleash the events that characterize the inter-advent age, or the time between the advents, the first and second comings of our Lord, the end times, so to speak. Just as we have coronation in chapter 5, so now in chapter 6 we have the events that attend to this time. And as you already noticed, when when we read through chapter 6, how did the chapter end? With the final judgment. The, the, the nation saying, hide us, the day has come for the wrath of the Lamb. Who can abide it? So with chapter 5 behind us, the beginning of Christ's reign, and with the final judgment in front of us at the end of chapter 6, we'll get our first real overview of the kinds of things that go on between the first and second comings of Christ, installed after his resurrection and now reigning and awaiting the final coming. Here's the big message chapter 6, the dominant theme that we should think about when we read these events, it is that Christ rules over them. Christ rules over the events that take place between his first and second comings. The events that come into your life, the, the, the types of things that take place during your days, Christ rules over them. He has authority over salvation, and he has authority over judgment. He's sitting on the throne because he's redeemed his people, and yet at the same time, now he's going to break seals, and he is going to unleash events on the earth that that result in judgment and tribulation, and yet at the same time, the salvation of his people. Christ rules over these events, and yet at the same time, not only does does he rule over them, they actually serve his ends. The the, the events that are unleashed in chapter 6 actually accomplish the plan of our sovereign Christ. How does, how does that work out? Well, for believers, these sufferings that come on the earth, that this is the means of our victory. Just as Christ suffered and then was victorious, so the people of God are a people who suffer and reign through that suffering. The suffering is the means of them enjoying the victory that Christ has won for them. Satan would use these trials to conquer our faith. Satan would use suffering so that we lose our faith, or perhaps so that unbelievers never come to faith. But the message of this chapter is that in Christ we are victorious. We are victorious over even these things. And as Christ controls them so they cannot so overwhelm and destroy the people of God. And at the same time, the events that come upon an unbelieving world are their judgment. It is their judgment for rejecting the kingship of Christ. It is their judgment for persecuting believers. And it is, a, it is a warning to them of the final judgment that is coming if they do not repent. So having given you that, let's just go through the chapter and look as Christ breaks these seals. And I think it will drive home that message of sovereignty over salvation and judgment. The first four seals are well known to you. If you've read Revelation before, you've probably heard about the first four seals. They're even well-known in popular culture. Movies or books will refer to them at times, and they are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, they have a certain logic to them. The first uh, horse goes out in conquest, 
And that leads, what, to civil unrest, war, and destruction, and then famine arising from that and death. As you have conquest and war, the results are famine and death. There's a logical sequence. But at the same time, even though they come one after the other, they're probably all going on at the same time. They're the kinds of things, I say, that take place between the first and second comings of Christ. If you think about it, conquest and war and famine all result in death. If those things are taking place, then death is taking place. And if you go over to, say, a Matthew 24 or a Mark 13, where Jesus did the same thing in the Gospels, describe the inner Advent period, you will see all these same events. Yet in that chapter, it's pretty clear that they're all going on at the same time. So though they're four in sequence, it's the kinds of things that take place during the inner Advent period. Now they have a strong Old Testament background, like most of the seals in Revelation. They're rooted in the Old Testament. Let me just read you a quote regarding the horsemen, because this author put it really well. He says, the most obvious background is Zechariah chapter 6. If you're a note taker, you want to go home and read Zechariah 6, verses 1 through 8. You will see in that chapter four groups of horses, and they have different colors. They are commissioned by God, back in Zechariah, to patrol the earth and to punish those nations that they see oppressing God's people. Remember your Old Testament history. Israel sinned, and because of that, he raised up nations to discipline them. These nations are raised up by God to be a rod of punishment to his people, but they inflicted more retribution on Israel than they should have. So now God will punish them for their transgressions as a vindication of his jealous love for Israel. That's Zechariah. So now come into Revelation 6. The horses in Revelation 6, therefore, signify the natural and political disasters that go on throughout the world caused by Christ in order to judge unbelievers who persecute Christians and in order to vindicate his people, and that vindication will show his love for his people and his justice. So that's what's going on here. Back in Zechariah, you had a very similar image four horses patrolling the earth to punish those who hurt his people. John has taken that image and put it in this book. Christ is unleashing a series of judgments on the world because they reject him because they hurt his people. It will punish unbelievers, and yet it will also bring believers through suffering unto victory. And for John's first readers, take your mind back now to the first century, there would have been a lot of historical background here where they would have read that and said, okay, I see that. That makes a lot of sense. Leading up to the writing of Revelation, consider some of these events. You had Nero's cruel mass persecution after the fire of Rome in AD 64. Compare that with the fifth seal, the martyrs under the altar. You had destructive earthquakes in AD 60. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius that buried a whole town alive in an instant. That was a natural disaster of their day. That The news spread and it was terrifying. You had a grain famine in AD 92. And of course you had Domitian's persecutions. He reigned for about 15 years. So both those who knew the Old Testament would have read this and said, okay, I I know what that's about, God judging unbelievers. And those living in Rome and in the Roman Empire, knowing their recent history, would have said, oh, yeah, I see some of this going on all around me. That is how John is written in order to communicate this message. Let's just look at some of the details of the four horses, and we'll move quickly through these. In verse 1, John says, I watched as a lamb opened the first of the seven seals, And then I heard one of the living creatures say, come. That's a consistent pattern that will go on for the first four seals. The lamb, Christ, will break it. He's the sovereign one. He's the one who's going to make this happen. And then one of the four living creatures, which we said represent creation under God's control, they will say, come. And then you will have a horse ride forth from the throne. So there's this really strong uh, undertone of Christ being in total control of these disasters that are going forth. The first horse that emerges in verse 2 is white. And we read that its rider is bent on conquest. Now, some, not all, some have seen this first horse as actually representing Christ 
or the gospel going forth triumphantly. And why is that? Because in the book of Revelation, white almost always has a positive connotation. It refers to righteous acts or purity. So some would say, all right, at the very beginning of God's reign, he sends the gospel forth triumphantly. And that, that's got some weight to it. I'm more inclined to see the white horse in the traditional way of, of being negative like the other three horses. Why is that? Well, what we just said from Zechariah, the Old Testament background, all four of those horses are negative. They're horses of judgment. Throughout the inner Advent age, you will have nations bent on conquest. Nations that are determined to conquer one another and to vie for its power. And I think that's what you have represented here by the white horse. Again, if you were to read Matthew 24, Mark 13, one of those places where Jesus describes the inner advent period one of the signs is the rise of false christ so i think the white horse is probably negative in nature so again what does the white horse represent well again the nations vying for power the nations are competing with one another you have empires that want to be in control well what often happens when empires are in control god's people are caught in the crosswinds They are called to be loyal to one empire or another, and when they are not, they are persecuted because of their disobedience to the state. Keep in mind that, again, that Old Testament history where where Assyria conquered Israel and where Babylon conquered uh, Judah, and then Persia comes along and, and sends them back home, but then up comes Greece wanting to conquer, and Greece has to make its way through Israel, and they can't have any trouble from these religious Israelites while they're trying to conquer the world and eventually do battle with Rome. Rome will conquer Greece and, and, and again, do the same thing. We can't have all these Jews with their religious, weird ways causing us trouble. While the nations are vying for power, they don't want religious people getting in their way. They don't want religious people stirring up trouble. And so often there is persecution against the people of God while the nations vie for power. That is what John is communicating with this first verse. Throughout the history of the world, the nations will compete And sometimes God's people will suffer as a result of their conquests for power. But despite their evil nature, they are under the command of God. The lamb breaks the seal. The living creature says, come. The horse rides from the throne. And what do we read in verse 2? He was given a crown. Passive verb. Not he earned a crown or got a crown. He was given a crown. Who gave him the crown? God gave him the crown. So ultimately, all of these nations are still dependent upon God for their authority, and they can do nothing without his control. That encourages God's people to persevere when they suffer from such enemies. Let's go on to the second horse. Verse 3 repeats the pattern, and in verse 4, the second horse rides forward. Now we have a red horse. And we read that its rider was given power, again, notice passive verb, given power, to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. That uh, verb, by the way, kill each other, often used in uh, context in the Bible dealing with civil strife. There's some kind of civil strife going on where, where people within an area are fighting with one another. And the result of that is much like the first. As people are un, uh, going through times of unrest, perhaps resulting from all this conquest, they persecute the people of God. Notice the similar language from Matthew 10.34. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Very similar language. Jesus' point there is that his followers should not be discouraged from confessing his name to the world when persecution comes, since such persecution is part of God's sovereign will. Their faithfulness amid oppression may result in the loss of physical life, but it will also result in the salvation of spiritual life. So does Jesus bring peace? Yes, on one level he does. He brings peace between man and God. He brings peace between men and men through the gospel. Blessed are the peacemakers. But often because of Jesus, when people must be loyal to him and therefore not to other factors, other factors who would say, show us more loyalty, that's when peace is taken away. And sword is the result. Jesus wants us to know that's going to happen. He said it in John, in this world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. His whole point is that while all this is going on, I am reigning, and though you may suffer for the gospel, I will take care of you. 
Third, the third horse comes forth. It's a black horse, verses 5 and 6. And this horse represents famine. Notice that it is holding a pair of scales in his hand. Often during times of famine, scales would be used to ration out amounts of food. Somebody has to control the food supply, and they ration it out. And they ration it out at very high prices. Notice verse 6. Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages. Those are amounts are just enough food to feed a typical family. So you have to work for a whole day and all you get is enough food for just one day. Those prices there are about six to 18 times the average prices in the Roman Empire at the time. So there's, there's, there's rising food costs and there's not enough money left over to buy anything else. Your, your whole work for the day can only buy the day's food. You're living day by day. But notice the other statement, and hurt not the oil or the wine. This is to encourage us that though there is famine, the famine is limited. There is still oil and wine available, symbols of luxury. So there's not enough money to buy them. But the famine hasn't been so hard that it's it's destroyed them. You have famine here, but it is famine under the control of God. He is still reigning over it and not putting on his people any more than he can bear. Ties into persecution, by the way, because often during times of limited resources, the state will control the means of food and they might put certain requirements on gaining it. I think this is what the mark of the beast is getting after in chapter 13. If if they're not loyal to the beast, when the beasts often represent governments in Scripture, then they're not allowed to have access to food. If they don't take his mark, if they don't show loyalty to that state, they are not allowed to have food. So there might be suffering because the Christians are not loyal to the state. They're not loyal to the means that would give them access to food. But though that might be scary, though that might be terrifying, what is Jesus' point? It's limited. It's limited. It is under the control of God. Fourthly and finally, the fourth horseman that rides forward, he expresses the results of the previous three. He's pale green. Death rides on the horse. Hades, which is the realm of the dead, follows closely behind. In other words, because of the conquest and because of the war and because of the famine, there is death. Devilish forces going forward and suffering because of all of this evil. But one more time, notice it is under the authority of God, and even there, he limits it. He breaks the seal, he sends forward the horse. But what do we read here in the last part of verse 8? They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Usually that's read to say, okay, during the seven-year tribulation, one quarter of the world's population will die Because of these four horsemen. Here's what I think the point is. During the inner advent age, there will be death. There will be famine. There will be war. There will be conquest. It's saddening and it's a little scary. But what is Jesus' point? It's limited. It can't touch more than a fourth of the earth. It is under my control. It's not worldwide. It's a fourth of the earth. It only affects a limited number of people. It may come to you. It may not. God's mercy may spare it. If it does come to you, it's because Jesus sent it from his throne, under his authority, in order to accomplish his purposes of salvation and judgment. Difficult times that will go on during the uh, times between the coming, but under Christ's authority as well. And when we look at world history, we see that these are the kinds of things that take place throughout history. They're the kinds of things that take place before the coming of Christ. They're the kinds of things that have taken place since. They're the kind of things that take place in our day and age. And they're the kind of things that took place in previous days and ages. Not always 100%, not always in, throughout the whole world. But these are the kinds of things that God's people will wrestle with. These are the kinds of things that will present uh, temptations to compromise. But these are the kinds of things Jesus says, I will use to bring you through and to be victorious, to judge unbelievers and to save my people. So let's shift into the latter half of the chapter and see where that theme of salvation really comes to the forefront. The first four seals focused on suffering. The fifth seal shows us the reaction of the persecuted saints who were killed for their faith. Because of these things going forward in the wisdom of God, many die for their faith. And when the fifth seal is broken, we read their prayer. Let's look at verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal... 
I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Now notice what we have going on here. Martyrs, where are they? Under the altar. What does that emphasize? The sacrificial nature of their faith. We will also read about their prayers going up to God later in chapter 8. Here in chapter 6, they are praying to God, how long until you avenge us? Now, now notice, though how, notice how they pray. First, they say, how long, sovereign Lord? They recognize the sovereignty of God even over their suffering. They say that he is holy and true. And because he's holy and true, they pray for him to judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Now, is this a prayer for revenge? No, I don't think it's a prayer for revenge. Jesus himself on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Uh, uh, Stephen, when he was being stoned, said, Lord, do not lay this charge to their feet. But what are they concerned about? They are concerned for the reputation of God. He is holy and true, yet he might be considered unholy. He might be considered unjust. He might be considered unfaithful if he does not punish sin. And therefore, they ask for him to do that in order to vindicate his holiness, in order to vindicate his truth, and in order to bring evildoers to justice. It's interesting that that in the judgment that comes upon unbelievers, God's attributes are still highlighted. God doesn't look bad when some perish. That's not something that embarrasses God. We We have to kind of ignore that. Even in the destruction of the wicked, God's justice is seen, and his attributes are highlighted. His holiness and faithfulness come to the forefront, and God's people praise him for that. I think just quick rabbit trail, sometimes we wonder, in heaven will I know those who aren't there? Well, will I be sad over it? I don't think we'll be rejoicing in in gleeful ways over destruction, but we will praise God. God, you knew what you were doing, you have accomplished your purpose, and you have judged those who fought against you. Everything God does results in the worship of his holy name. And here is the answer then that is given to the suffering saints. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been killed. What is God giving to them? He's giving them a white robe to symbolize their purity. Heaven is declaring that they are in the right. The world passed a guilty verdict on them. The world said you're a nuisance. The world said you're a problem and killed them. God says you are my people. You are vindicated. You are righteous. And even though you're suffering, it is part of my sovereign plan. Last time, the end of that verse, until the full number of their fellow servants were killed just as they had been killed. The the root word, their idea is this word of fulfillment. How long must we suffer, Lord? Until it's all fulfilled. Until the full number of my people comes in. It's part of a plan what you're undergoing. And when that plan is complete, then I will judge. And that prayer then is answered in the last seal, the sixth seal of this chapter, which is the final judgment on the unbelieving world, where God vindicates his reputation and displays his justice. Notice some of the imagery from verses 12 through 14. There's a great earthquake. The sun turns black. The moon becomes red like blood. The stars in the sky fall to the earth just like figs drop from a tree. The heavens recede like a scroll and every mountain and island is removed from its place. Now, this language may or may not be literal. It, that may be exactly what happens when Christ comes. Creation literally comes undone. It could also be figurative. Here's why I say that. Because in the Old Testament, this kind of language is often used to describe God's judgment against sinful nations. And I've got a list of verses if you want to fact check me on that. When God describes the destruction of Babylon, he uses these symbols. Well, they didn't come to pass literally in that time. They're a way of, of, again, earth-shattering news, a phrase we sometimes use. The Bible speaks in that kind of language. And God is saying, I'm going to come and I'm going to judge all these nations. So it may be literal. It may be figured. Here's the point. This is the language that says God is coming to judge. God is coming to declare his verdict against the nations 
who do not follow him. Well, who are the recipients of that judgment? Verse 15, the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, everyone else, whether slave or free. In other words, all those who follow a corrupt world system, all of those who persecute the people of God, all of those who do not have Jesus as their king. We read that they hide in the caves and in the rocks and the mountains. Again, language taken from the Old Testament, Isaiah 2, where we read that idolatrous Israelites hide in the caves in order to avoid God's judgment, judgment that was coming upon them by means of the Babylonian exile. God is saying those who don't know me, those who trust in idols, are going to try and hide. They're going to be like Adam and Eve, hiding from my judgment. But at the end of the day, what happens? Verse 17, the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it. And of course, this calls to mind Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment, the judgment at the end of time when earth and heaven flee away, the books are open, and the dead are judged. The day of wrath comes, and no one can withstand it. So what do we say in response to these seals? Three things, I'll just name them, and we'll be done. Number one, calamitous world events are not a threat to God's sovereignty. No matter how calamitous, they are exactly what God has designed for the inner advent age. Sometimes things going on and and we hear more through the news and we say things are getting worse. The the end times must be upon us. You know what? In one sense, they've been upon us for 2,000 years. These are the kinds of things God does. That it looks worse or maybe even gets worse is not a threat to his sovereignty. This is how he accomplishes his purposes. They are all under his control. Your own personal suffering is a part of God's plan. Don't let it be a threat to to, to Scripture trustworthy. Can I trust God? This proves that God is trustworthy. He's doing exactly what he said he would do in his word. Two, part of his plan for believers at times does involve suffering and persecution, but take heart. God loves you. He will vindicate you. He's not threatened by that harm coming to you. He will bring you through it in a victorious way. He has not forgotten about you. Your suffering is the means of your reigning. So that thirdly and finally, the present world system in which we live, it will be destroyed. Nothing on this earth can bring us security. Nothing that people might put before us as a means of security is something that we can trust. Our trust is in the Lord alone. And again, I think that's a good reminder whenever you enter any election season and you have any candidate being put forward. It doesn't matter which one wins. God is the one in whom we trust. We don't have to trust one or the other to accomplish something that will make uh, America good and, and safe for us to live in for the next few years. God is the king. He's in control. This world system will be destroyed. We trust in God alone to be our deliverer from all evil. So let's trust in him and let's assure our hearts of his love. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for...